Hey YouTube, I'm Jimmy. In this video, I'm going to walk through how to research a company and ways we can learn to become a better investor. I plan on starting with the very basics and I'll give ideas along the way for how we can take our investing game to the next level. So I've been investing for over 15 years and I started investing shortly before I went into college. Then I got my bachelor's degree, I got my master's degree, and I'm currently working towards my doctorate of business with a specialization in finance. But my real love for investing came from when I was young and my father worked on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And that was really my early introduction to investing. That being said, I understand that investing can seem intimidating for people who have never been around it or have never done it for the first time. Or if you're just starting out, the process itself can seem you know, quite overwhelming. So what I'm hoping to do here is I'm going to break down the actual process I go through whenever I analyze a new company. And I believe that if we follow this process, we can all get really good at analyzing companies and ultimately picking companies to invest in. So if you're not 100% confident on how to read financial statements, I think that this book is a fantastic place to start. It's called Warren Buffett and the Interpretation of Financial Statements. And I got an Amazon link in the description below. But I like it because it's very simple. I, that's really the reason I love this book. And as you can see, it's quite a small book and it's super easy to read. Now, I think that Mary Buffett, she's one of the authors. I think that she used to be married to, or she still is married to, I'm not sure, I, married to Warren Buffett's son. And, and although this is called Warren Buffett and the Interpretation of Financial Statements, I can safely say after reading it that this is not a shortcut for thinking like Warren Buffett thinks as far as investing goes. But I'm not even saying that's why I would like the book. What I'm saying is that they do a fantastic job of making it very, very simple. They walk through different key ratios, different pieces of each of the financial statements. And I think it's an amazing place to start. If you want to learn how to read financial statements like Buffett does, then Ben Graham's book, Security Analysis, is the place to go. But I read that book and I love reading about this stuff. And that is a really tough book to read. That book took me over a year to read. This one took like, you know, a couple hours. I mean, it's really quite simple. Okay, so now let's pretend that you're comfortable with the basics of financial statements. And you could probably move on to these next steps, even if you have just the very basics, uh, the, just a very basic understanding of financial statement analysis. And I put the links, I put links to the videos that we created on each of the financial statements in the description below. And you could probably get away with just that for now. But I think the key to really becoming a good researcher and ultimately a good investor is being able to analyze a company's business or understand the business itself. So now let's look at how we can learn about the business. And if you're wondering, this is the, these are the exact steps I go through for every company that I research either for work or for when I'm making a, a video. However I do it, these are the steps. There's eight steps in general that we go through. Okay, so let's pull up any company. How about we start with the next company that I'm gonna cover for the Dow 30 analysis, Goldman Sachs. So the first step is to pull down the most recent annual report, which is called the 10K. Now, 10Ks are required to have a certain amount of information in them. One of those sections, one of the requirements is that they have a business description in it. So whenever I start with a new company, or even if it's been a while since I last analyzed a company, I always start with the business description. This is the business description for Goldman Sachs. And here they break out the segments, they break out uh, what the company does. And this one's about 20 some odd pages. And they're all usually in that area, call it 15 to 20 pages. So this isn't your typical, they throw a description out there. They do a really good job, at least Goldman did in this example, of explaining what the business does and how they make money. Now, many times when I first start researching a company, this may be as far as I get. If I get through this section and I don't like the business itself or it's too complicated or I question how many prospects they're going to have over the next few years, then I could just stop here. And I think that this is an important point because you can bail out on a company at any time. You don't need a thousand good investments. All you need is a handful of great ones and you can make a killing with your investments. So I think we all need to be very picky about the companies that we elect to ultimately put our money in. Okay, now we know what the business does, so now we're on to step two. Now we're going to read the most recent management discussion and analysis section 
from their most recent filing. If it was their annual filing, the same place you got the uh, business description, great. Otherwise, you have to pull down the quarterly filing, which is called the 10Q. Now, the business section is usually only in the 10K, but the MD&A section is usually in every one of their quarterly and annual filings. Now, sticking with our Goldman example, Goldman's annual report was filed on February 26th of 2018. It's now November, so it's a bit outdated. But their last quarterly report was filed just two weeks ago. So we know the business section is from back in February and the MDNA section is just from two weeks ago. So in the MDNA section, we're gonna learn a lot about the business, uh, what management, what the management team is trying to do with the business, what their plan is. They might talk about the industry, maybe what uh, different trends that are happening in the industry. They're likely to break down the financial report performance for each of the sectors. And basically they're gonna talk about how the business as a whole is performing. Now, I bring up the dates because I think it's important to remember if you're reading the business section and it was from almost a year ago, well, just keep that in the back of your mind. You know, you might want to update those numbers in your head as you're reading through the quarterly uh, md &A section. Okay, and this kicks us right over to step three, which is onto the financial statements. And I highly recommend that we pull those financial statements directly from the latest quarterly and annual reports because these financial statements come with the footnotes and the footnotes can be key to understanding the financials. Often, a company does something unique with a particular line item, and in the footnotes, they explain what they're doing and why they're doing it. So if they were ever going to, let's say, change an accounting rule or adopt a different accounting rule, well, we should probably just Google what that accounting rule change is, and I think that this type of practice can get us really good at exposing ourselves to different types of financial statement analysis. And I think that the more we look at the actual financial statements, not something off of, let's say, Yahoo Finance or whatever it might be, go to the actual source. And if you have a question about a particular line item, look at the footnotes, they'll probably explain it there. Now, step four is get the company presentations and recent earnings calls. Now, steps two, three, and four can really be pushed together or swapped around because for me on a personal basis, after I read the business section, assuming I still like the company, well, I go ahead and download everything from steps two, three, and four all at once because each of these are often interdependent and sometimes they say the same thing in each of them. So I think it's a, great, a bit faster just to download them all at once and start going through them together. Now, up until this point, we've made no attempt to value the company. All we're doing at this point is getting to know the firm, understanding what they do, how they make money, where their margins, what does their growth rate look like, do they have free cash flow? How does free cash flow look? Uh, what's management's plan? Do we think that their plan is reasonable? Things like that. During steps two through four, those are the questions you're, try you're trying to answer. Okay, now in step five, now we need to find competitors. So in their md &A section, or maybe in the business section, or maybe in the earn earnings call, well, we would have come across hopefully something about the industry. And now we need to identify competitors. Ideally, two or three of them. If we could do that, I'm happy. Now, at this point, we know the company well, and you know what they do, you know what they're planning to do, you understand where they're going, and now once we find competitors, what we wanna do is we wanna read a little bit about each of the competitors and try to understand what their plan is. What's their growth rate like? What's their margins like? What business line are they trying to go into? And sometimes if, let's say you see a big difference in margins between one company and another, you could look at, well, why is there such a big difference? Sometimes this reveals a competitive advantage that one company has over another. So now once you understand the very basics of what the competitors do, you pick two or three and we move on to step six. Now we wanna to try to value our company. Now, assuming that we still like them, of course. Now, sometimes you'll come across one of the competitors and you'll say, I like this one better. Maybe I'll switch over to that company, to that competitor, because maybe they have a competitive advantage that we identified so what we do is we start this exact same process over with them. But this time, imagine how much easier it's going to be to understand that business, read the management discussion over there, because now we're going to know that business so much better. We're gonna know the industry, we're gonna understand the language so much better. So the second, the third, the fourth time we do this for similar companies, the easier this is going to get. But now let's imagine that we still like our company. So now what we wanna do is we wanna try different valuation methods. 
Maybe we try discounted cash flow or PE multiple or EV to EBITDA. There are lots of choices and the more experience we get with different types of companies and different types of value, valuation methods, the better we'll get at choosing which one is appropriate for that particular situation. Now, this is also where you wanna compare the company with their competitors, compare their ratios, also compare the company with themselves from prior years. If management says that they have a particular plan in mind, well, how long is that plan in place? Are they actually working it? Can we see it in the numbers? And for me, I think you can learn a ton about a company with this type of analysis. Digging into the differences from year to year or from company to company can really point out a lot. Personally, this is also where I like to find industry associations. Often, these types of groups can do a great job of explaining the industry, explaining the potential of the industry, maybe the projections or the future of the industry. And I think that this is great to identify what our company does, what their competitors do, where they fall overall in the industry. Now, if you have access to analyst research, this is a good place to pull it all down. I like to see what valuation methods they're using, what does consensus say about revenue or about earnings, and personally, what I like to do is I start with consensus for revenue, let's say, or even for earnings per share, and then I read their investment thesis, and I say, you know what, I'm either more bullish than they are, or I agree with them, I'm right in line with what they're thinking, or I'm a bit more bearish than they are, and then I can adjust their expectations in one direction or, or another. If I think it should be higher, I can move it slightly higher, slightly lower, or much higher. Maybe they're not accounting for something. I also like to look at which valuation method they're using. Are they using PE or EV to EBITDA? And if I have access to a few different analyst reports, that could be useful to see how each of them do it so I can look to see at least what's popular among analysts from a valuation perspective. Don't forget, they, in theory, specialize in these types of companies. So in, in theory, they should know which type of valuation method is best. And this ties us into our next step, step seven. See what the stock is doing. Now, we also, we've calculated our fair value. We know what we believe the stock should be worth. Where's the stock actually trading? So sticking with Goldman, here's a recent chart from Goldman Sachs. Looks like they're trading right around $207. But here's the point of this step. This isn't necessarily to see where the stock is right now. Look at this drop right here. What happened? How about this drop? Or what made it move higher in this spot? And in each of these, we want to pull down the news from that time period to see if we can identify what was happening either with that company or with the industry to identify what moves the stock. Pretend with Goldman Sachs that every time a big headline comes out about rising interest rates or falling inflation or whatever it might be. And when that news comes out, well, the stock goes crazy in one way or another. That's good information for us because we want to know what is a driver. What does Wall Street or what do investors believe is a driver of this stock? You can usually tell that by looking at big movements and what put it there. Usually it's earnings, but sometimes it could be more than that. Now, it almost doesn't matter what drove it there. We now have an idea of what to look for going forward. Plus, if we see a similar headline come out one morning, let's say a month from now, after we've done all of our research, well, we probably have a good idea of how the company will react. And this brings us to our last step, step eight, look for a buying opportunity. Okay, so now we know what the company does, we know what their plans are, and we know what we believe they should be trading at. We've looked at some recent news, and now we need to determine what our personal margin of safety is. So if we like the company, but maybe we think that there's a lot of risk, well, we want a large margin of safety. Using the Goldman chart as an example, so if we think that this stock is really worth, let's say, 230 based on our calculations, well, maybe down here at 207, maybe that's good. Maybe that's plenty of margin of safety for us. But if we think the risks are larger, maybe we don't want to get into it unless it's at 190 or maybe below 175. That's going to depend based uh, depend on a lot of different things. Could be your portfolio, could be your level of risk tolerance, could be your confidence in your projections, whatever it might be. So now going back to the news for a second, one thing that I really like to see if there's a company like this that maybe I wanted to get below 190. One thing that I really like to see is, let's pretend earnings come out and they miss by a penny and the stock drops you know, 9% because of it. Well, that could be a pretty dramatic drop for something that over the long run doesn't change a lot. Unless the fundamentals of where we think the business is going or management changes their plans or something like that, that could be an enormous opportunity. 
I look for something like that as a buying opportunity to get this stock back within my margin of safety. So if I want it below 190 or below 175, whatever it might be, that looks like an ideal opportunity to me. Don't let everybody selling off scare you away from your analysis. If you need to, update the analysis, but don't let them scare off if you're confident with what you've done, uh, with the research that you've done. So at the end of the day, if you like this company, well, we can go out and buy it. Simple, great, that's easy. But maybe you want to wait for it to get below 190 or 175 or whatever. Fine, what I like to do is I have a bullpen of stocks where I just put it over there and I wait for them to get there. And then what I do almost immediately is move on to the next company. This is the key point to remember with this whole process that the idea here is that the more you read about companies, the more you analyze different industries and how different companies play different roles, the more ideas you're gonna come up with and the better you're going to get at analyzing companies and ultimately coming up with great investment opportunities. So, if you have any questions or if there's anything that you would do when analyzing a company that I didn't mention here, please post them in the comments below and thank you for sticking around all the way to the end of the video. And if you haven't done so already, hit the subscribe button and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks.